David, here you are getting ready for your talk tonight um, over at the Summer House on Spring Island. Are you, are you nervous? What, what are you, what's this talk about? Well, actually, J.J., I gave it last night. <laughs> and you didn't push the record button okay. in time, okay. so I'm going to do the first part that you didn't record. Okay. And we'll catch up from there. But as I said last night, um, on a Thursday, right before we're leaving, uh, it's a great opportunity for us to do something that I really enjoy doing uh, two days before we leave. So let's get right into it. I'm going to start with uh, a little teaser here. This is a picture of the New York City Easter Parade in 1903. And the question is, see all those horses? Somewhere in there, there's a car. Can you see it? Well, you probably can't, but there is. There's one car right there in the middle of this sea of horses. The really interesting thing is that 12 years later, the same Easter parade, there's a sea of cars, and the question is, can you see the horse? And the answer is, there's one horse, and he's right there. The point is that exponential change driven by technology is something that humans are unable to grasp. It's just we're not wired for it. It happens so fast and so quickly that we're almost oblivious to it. Bill Gates said that people overestimate what will happen in the next three years and greatly underestimate what will happen in the next 10. And of course, the equivalent in our generation of the car taking over the horse is what happened in the digital world. It's hard to believe that it was only 12 years ago that Steve Jobs stood up and held up an iPhone and said, hello world, this is going to change the world. And lo and behold, 12 years later, 68% of all human beings on the planet Earth now have mobile phones. Unbelievable. So, I believe that artificial intelligence is more powerful than cars, than the iPhone, or any other technology. In fact, the CEO of Google said at Davos in February of 2018, artificial intelligence is more profound than humanity's mastery of electricity or fire. So, I believe that. And so let's look forward 12 years from now and see what's going to happen. I believe that by the year 2030, society globally is going to be profoundly transformed. Progress towards this goal will be unstoppable for reasons I'll discuss. The benefits of this transformation are going to be massive, but there's a lot at stake. The future of work, the nature of the economy, human values, and possibly the destiny of the human species itself. Another thing that's going to happen in 2030 is that my youngest grandson, Fred, is going to be turning 16 years old. That's a pretty interesting time for him to turn 16. So I say to myself, what does Fred need to know? This is what has driven me and my interest in this topic. My interest in the topic actually got started uh, in my association with the Hastings Center when Elon Musk, through the Future of Life Institute, which he funded, uh, came to us and asked us to take a look at the ethics of artificial intelligence we put together a three-year working group. I became very involved in it, and I ended up being a co-author of the final report and presented the results of that uh, in public meetings in both New York City and Yale uh, in December of last year. I've also been invited uh, to be a participant in the Partnership on AI for the Benefits of Human and Society, which is a nonprofit that was founded by Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, IBM, and Microsoft. It's now some 150 people worldwide, all sorts of disciplines. Kickoff meeting was held in Berlin. I was an attendee there. I was the oldest person in the room by at least 20 years. Uh, I've attended another meeting and several working groups, one in San Francisco, and I will be going to London for a third annual meeting uh, later this year. Uh, I'm also involved with a uh, colleague of mine, Wendell Wallach, who is a uh, scholar at Hastings and at Yale University. And he and I have a rather bold idea, which is that the world needs some sort of governance process to manage the evolution 
of AI because we believe that uh, without guardrails, it potentially could uh, have very, very uh, harmful effects. Um, we're not positive that's going to happen, but we, the UN did sponsor a meeting which we were able to lead uh, uh, in September, and we're testing the idea, and it may happen. So let's get into the actual talk itself. First, a little basics. Uh, everybody's heard the term AI, but <clears throat> what is it? Well, there's a lot of ways you could answer that, but I think the simplest way is to recognize that at its core, AI is essentially software. That's what it is. It is software that does, that mimics any actions that require human intelligence. It could be perception, motion, manipulation of things, solving problems, representing knowledge, planning, learning, reasoning, social skills, creative skills, anything involving the human brain is fair game for artificial intelligence. And the way it works and the way it's created is in two steps. First, it has to learn how to do each and every one of those things. In some way, it learns how to do that. We'll talk in a minute how that happens. And once it's learned how to do something, it then acts. And it can act by assisting humans with tasks that they know how to do, basically relieving them of tedious work, making them more efficient, less error prone, and so forth. In some cases, it can actually augment what humans do, because it can do things that humans can't do. So it provides the opportunity for humans and AI to work together as collaborators, and where one plus one equals more than two. Uh, or in some cases, it can become so good at what it does that it replaces humans. It's, it is p potentially, uh, and this could either be very good or very bad, depending upon which task uh, you're talking about. And we'll talk about some of that as well. How does AI learn? Well, there's two ways. The first way is called machine learning. You might have seen it around, if, if you, it's hard to miss it in the news. But, but machine learning is essentially software that is looking for patterns in any kind of data. The data could be economic data, social data, genomics data, financial data, any kind of data, physical data about the planet and the Earth. And it's, it looks for patterns, and often the patterns that it finds are actually undetectable by humans because the power of the computer has become so great that it can look so deeply that it can find things that we can't. The training that is, and learning that it's doing can either be supervised or unsupervised. Supervised means I'd like you to be able to identify a cat, and it'll be shown millions of pictures of things, and eventually it'll know that's a cat. Or it can be unsupervised, which is, here's all the data around the human genome and a lot of other data other than human genome data around it. Tell me what you find. Tell me what genes might be doing, which genes are doing what. So that's, that's the two different categories of, <clears throat> of learning data. The key to why it's taken off so fast is it lives on data and it lives on processing power. And the more there is, the faster and better it becomes. The second way that AI learns is like a baby. It has no data. It simply is given a goal, like don't lose this chess game. Doesn't even know what the rules are yet. <laughs> but it just starts playing. And it makes mistakes. And it basically creates uh, its own data by its mistake database. And eventually, like a baby, it runs millions of experiments over and over and over again and basically ratchets its way up to proficiency. And when I say millions, I'll come back to that. <clears throat> so what types of AI are there? Well, everything you're hearing about today and everything that will be created in the next 10 or 12 years is within the community is called narrow AI. <clears throat> we'll talk about why it's called narrow AI. But what it means is it does a very specific thing that it's been asked to do. Identify a face, uh, translate language, uh, diagnose a cancer, do something. <clears throat> it's highly effective, or can be, but it's very inflexible. 
It's a Johnny OneNote. It only does that. The growth drivers, as I said, are a huge database, massive computer power, so it's taking off like crazy. The question on people's minds is, could it ever be as smart as humans? So can narrow AI ever become what's known as artificial general intelligence, AGI, that's what it's called. But there are a lot of hurdles to get there. It has to learn something that babies learn very quickly, common sense. It has to be adaptable to context. If I learn how to swing a baseball bat, it actually helps me learn how to hit a golf club. AI can't do that. You have to retrain for every single thing it does. So an ability to become context sensitive is a massively hard technical challenge, and thousands of people are working on it. And it has to learn how to learn. That's what we've done as humans. Those are all human things. Those are very difficult technical challenge. So as a result, the timing on when that'll occur is, we'll talk about at the end, is <clears throat> there's a lot of controversy over it. When and if or when that'll ever happen. Excuse me. <clears throat> Then there's the question of superintelligence. Could they actually be smarter than us? Not just equal to us, but smarter than us. And of course, this is what Hollywood loves to fixate on. This is, we read about Hal and the Matrix and the Terminator in the movie Her, if you ever saw that. And the question is, if it gets there, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Is it Nirvana or is it hell? We don't know. We'll talk about that. So let's talk about narrow AI, the here and now. What can it do today? Well, games is what really got people's attention several years ago. There's a, uh, AlphaGo, which was a product of a company called DeepMind, which was a software group in London that Google bought for $3 billion, a bunch of kids. And they went out and built, through machine learning, something called AlphaGo. And AlphaGo's job was saying, here's every Go game ever played by humans anywhere in history. Go look at it and come back and try to win. And of course, nobody thought anything would happen, and they did. And four months later, AlphaGo played <clears throat> the world's champion in Go, a South Korean. Killed him. Absolutely stunned everybody. They thought it was the most complex game in the world. This is impossible. It can't work. A year later, Google built AlphaZero. This time, they said, forget human games. Go play each other and figure out your own strategies. In four hours, millions of games were played, and AlphaZero killed AlphaGo. <laughs> so, but AI is already a lot more than games. It can see. You've heard about these cameras that are taking pictures of people in China. Face recognition. 20 airports in the United States are going to have facial recognition in the next two and a half years. It hears. It's better than humans in transcribing speech into text. It understands. It can lip read better than lip readers. It works. It makes hiring decisions. It drives robots in factories. It does all sorts of things already. It diagnoses. It's, it can beat certain, certain forms of radiology and dermatology and other forms of Things. So it, you know, as a diagnostic, it's at least an augmentation, possibly a replacement. And it's definitely in our lives every day. It's Waze, it's Siri, it's Alexa, it's airline pricing, it's Amazon telling you what you ought to buy next. All of that is AI. In fact, this leads to a paradox. Because once AI solves a problem and be becomes useful to us, it's no longer considered AI. We just accept it. It's in the world. Oh, wh when's AI coming? Well, guess what? It's here. AI is anything that hasn't been done yet. That's what Hofstadter said. And my favorite philosopher, Daniel Dennett at Tufts, said, what begins as an option to improve our lives soon becomes an obligation. And we become dependent on these things. So what's it going to do to the economy? Well, I'm not going to go through all the details here, but just go down the list mentally here. Every single sector of the global economy is going to be transformed by AI in one way or the other. 
healthcare and automotive. I'll talk about those in a little more detail on the next slide. But financial services are going to change, transportation, technology, media and telecommunications, retail, energy, manufacturing, farming. There isn't a sector of society that won't change. To give a little bit more flavor for that in two areas, in healthcare. Healthcare, I guarantee you, is going to be better, safer, fairer, and cheaper. For doctors, as I said, diagnostics are going to improve. Surgical assistance for certain kinds of surgery, improvements. Massive administrative relief. Right now, your doctor is sitting there going like, he's just not going to have to do that, because once we get things together, uh, AI can take care of a lot of the administrative support going on behind the scenes. So that's a huge benefit coming down the line. Patients, uh, compliance monitoring for, for uh, prescriptions they're on. The, the concept of an annual physical is going to be like a buggy whip. Physicals are going to be ongoing, routine, inside of you, remotely delivered at some point. You, you don't need to be thinking about, I got to go to the doctor. If something's wrong, the doctor is going to hear about it. On the, on the cure side, genetic diseases are going to be uncovered. Uh, drugs are going to be designed. The same Google company that built AlphaGo has built a system that's figured out uh, protein folding, which is an extremely complicated uh, physical problem. And it's going to lead to very, very shortened <clears throat> drug design. On the automotive side, the world we know in terms of driving is going to be so different in 12 years. Safer, greener, cheaper, more efficient. Uh, the old business model of selling cars is going to transform into mobility as a service. Uh, smart fleets, not only are they smart, they're connected. So what's learned in car A is learned in all the cars it's connected to. And all of those cars will be connected to the infrastructure that's, and the roads and the signs and so forth. So the ability to uh, manage patterns and avoid death is massive. <clears throat> There are a lot of challenges associated there. It starts out as driver assistance. Ultimately, it will be driver replacement. But that'll happen in ways. It'll probably start with trucks, maybe cabs in local cities. But eventually, give me 12 years, I guarantee you, it'll happen. <clears throat> and the implications go beyond the car world. They have implications for infrastructure, uh, parking. We won't need parking. Public mass transit, long fixed fixed link things will be dinosaurs and white elephants. So growth is unstoppable for two reasons, innovation and competition. On the innovation side, I mentioned machine learning and reinforcement learning. Those are the workhorses today, but that's just top of the second inning. There are many, many new algorithms coming along. And the people working on it are no longer an elite group of people who work for six companies and five universities. Because there are global AI software platforms that are being distributed around the world. And <clears throat> just like apps got developed sort of bottom up, there are millions of young people in China and India and Dubuque, Iowa and South Africa that are working on AI. <clears throat> But the real kicker is this. At some point, AI is going to learn how to create better AI. And when that happens, a recursive cycle will start up, and things will take off with no limits. But AI, if AI is software, you've got to remember that it's also sitting around other things that are exploding around it. The Internet of Things, which I'll talk about in a minute, is one of them, but robotics. Genomics and genetic engineering, virtual reality, nanotechnology, 3D printing, blockchain technology, quantum computing. All of these things are interacting, amplifying, and ratcheting up <clears throat> in ways that it's impossible to forecast the, the things that will be coming down the road. So let's talk about the Internet of Things, because I find it fascinating. <clears throat> what is it? The Internet of Things are sensors that are embedded in things that communicate. They capture and measure something, and then they send what they measured somewhere for analysis and action. 
It could be heat, could be light, could be motion, chemicals, moisture, could be anything. Anything that's measurable, the sensor will pick it up. It's then transmitted, as I said, somewhere, maybe to the cloud, but ultimately it's going to be transmitted a foot away to an edge box that's going to have AI in it and tell you what to do. So where's it going to go? Anywhere and everywhere. Cars, trucks, roads, ships, you can read it. There isn't a thing on Earth, including your body, that isn't going to have sensors, either in it or around it. Fitbit is just the starter. You know, everybody's got a Fitbit. That's, that's a sensor. That's, a, that's one of the Internet of Things sensors. Yeah. So IoT is going to explode. And why? Because it's getting really, really tiny, very flexible, very cheap. The marginal cost is approaching zero. There are 8 billion sensors deployed in the world today. By next year, it's going to be up to 50 billion and a trillion by 2030. So that means the databases that these things are filling are going to grow double every 18 months. And if you do the math on that, that's 64 times the amount of data just from IoT in the next 12 years. So what does all this mean? Well, this is the other reason that this is unstoppable. This is about economics and power, profits and control. Putin said in 2017, a slip of the tongue, the country who becomes a leader in AI is going to rule the world. A friend that I've gotten to know, a guy named Kai Fu Lee, you might have seen him on 60 Minutes. He's written a book about this. He says, forget it, Russia. This is a two-horse race. Every country in the world is going to be forced to align with either the US or China, and we're in a race. <clears throat> so let's take a look at the US versus China. If this was a boxing match, they'd call it the tail of the tape. <clears throat> well, we have an early lead. We are ahead. Not by much, but we're ahead. And our our, we're ahead because we are, we've gotten here because we have a very AI-centric ecosystem involving uh, the big companies and academia and so forth. It's very, very powerful. Our titans in the industry are the same people that formed the PAI. Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google, IBM, and Microsoft, uh, they are in a fierce competitive battle with each other. They know they either win this game or they die. Their mindset and their horizon is to be there in 10 years. Enormous amounts of capital are going into this. 60 billion in R&D, 27 billion VC capital, and 2,100 AI startups just in the last two years. If we have a problem, is that there's a distinct mistrust, distrust, that exists between corporations who don't trust the government, citizens who don't trust corporations or the government, the government who doesn't like the citizens. Anyway, so we are not cooperating. <laughs> We're not cooperating. What about China? Well, they have a very comprehensive, publicly announced, very ambitious national strategy. Their titans are Alibaba, Baidu, and Tencent. They're commercial companies, but they are an integral part of the national plan. And they have stated they want to catch the US by 2025 and dominate the world by 2030. Their horizon isn't 2030, it's the next century because they know that this is what it's all about. Their advantage is that they've got massive databases because they've got 2.3 billion citizens. And they've got a huge deployment of IoT in the form of all sorts of sensors, not just cameras, but everything. So they're, and they've, they're building a research ecosystem that is uh, akin to ours. It's not good as ours, but it's, it's on the way. <clears throat> Their focus is on control, surveillance, military, smart cities, e-commerce. And they've taken each one of these companies and say, you focus on that, you focus on that, and, you know. And culturally, opposed to us, they don't care about citizens' rights the way we do. So privacy is not an issue. So technical progress is the point. So they will move as fast as necessary. So what does this mean to the labor economy? Well, there's two things going on. 
Um, and this is natural, it happens with every technological, uh, technological revolution. The first is job description. Jobs will be destroyed. Those that are physical, repetitive, and structured are really up for grabs. 24% of the US labor force touches a wheel or equivalent of some sort of a control device. Those people are at risk. Job creation. Because it's narrow AI and hasn't learned all the things we've talked about yet, empathy, unstructured work, things that require creativity and leadership, those are ripe for growth. The question is, which is the stronger force? The bulls say, we well, you know we've seen this movie before. This is simply going to be Industrial Revolution 4.0. We're going to have a new economy ahead. It's going to be fabulous. Yes, we're going to have a disruption, and then we're going to move on. But at the end, it's going to be great. <clears throat> the bears say, nope, this one's different. This is really, really different. A new society is ahead, not a new economy. It's going to require a new social contract. There will be a permanent job crisis. Not everybody's going to be out of a job, but not everybody can expect that if I'm ready and want a job, I will have one. If that's true, the human impact on financial security, self-respect, dignity, fulfillment, up for grabs. It would create an existential policy crisis for liberal democracies around the world starting their own. <clears throat> the policy ideas that are emerging out of this and beginning to be talked about are things like a uniform basic income. If we can't get a job, even though I'm ready and willing and able, maybe we should start paying people just because they're citizens. Maybe we should put a tax on robots to help pay for that. And so anyway, who knows where that's going to go. I just throw those out there as there's some early thinking going on. If this is the scenario, what are we going to do about it? Personally, I come out, this is the only place I'm going to give you a view. McKinsey, I think, did the best job I've found on kind of thinking about this. They've done it three times over the last year or so, or three years. They say this will be by far the fastest, most disruptive labor market scenario in the history of humanity. The lost jobs, they estimate globally, for the 2.7 billion workers will be between four and 800 million, between 15 and 30 percent of jobs worldwide up for grabs. And the differences will vary significantly across countries, depending upon a number of factors, wage growth, you know, uh, average wage, and, and a number of demographic questions. India is probably least, <clears throat> least affected by this. They're going to get more growth than destruction. Japan is in worse shape. I mean, I, I can't remember the number. I think it's 50% of their jobs are up for grabs. It takes 10 years. It's a real problem for them. In the USA, we're with Germany. The, the, the midpoint estimate is 30% of our jobs, uh, about 45 million jobs, up for grabs in the next 12 years. The good news is, according to McKinsey, that a bright future is actually achievable. But it's going to take a few things to happen to make that so. Job training, safety nets, portable insurance, uh, creative private-public partnerships, and a significant transformation of our education system so that kids can, can not be taught rote, but can learn to learn how to learn and whatever, whatever. Just that, that's a subject unto itself. The bad news is that the transition over those 12 years is going to be brutal, because it is so big, and it is so fast, and it's cosmic. Current workers are going to bear the brunt, and it isn't just blue-collar jobs. It's white collar jobs. In fact, there's an argument that says some of those might happen first. Uh, mid offices and financial services companies, for example. The result of this is that the population is going to intensify. When people are feeling angst, bad things happen. This is, calls for a desperate need for political leadership. And if there's a downer point I want to make, it's this one. So. Beyond jobs, there are other human values at stake, other issues, other social implications. Some immediate concerns are safety. And I'm not going to go through all of them, but just take the car automotive thing as an example. 
the estimate is that once we're at full autonomy, of the 40,000 people that die on the highways every year, half of those lives could be saved. The question is, <clears throat> what does it take in a testing regime to get there? Perfection? We had you know, one person die in Arizona, and they stopped all testing. So the question, and, and, and by the way, that was appropriate because they weren't ready for it. But at some point, there's a trade-off that's going to have to be made. If they're demonstrably safer than humans, is that enough? And when will the local laws change? What insurance companies are going to do? And when, as just natural culture, are we going to say, I'm OK with it? Those are the barriers, much more than the AI itself, to full deployment. But as I said, give me 12 years, you'll see it. National security. If we ever create a drone that has AI that can make a decision without a human involved to kill, the nature of warfare is transformed forever. And there are people working on the ability to do that. The AI scientists, very much like the Einstein group, have pleaded for a permanent ban on lethal autonomous weapons. But a Cold War is underway. No matter what people say, it's, it's like a prisoner's dilemma. I know he's doing it, so I better do it. So that's what's going on. Whether it's actually deployed, who knows? That's the question. Privacy. Who controls? all this data that AI is using to learn and train and get good at all these different things. And it, surveillance, if it's deployed correctly, could actually make our cities a lot safer. But at what price? How do we balance public safety with individual privacy rights? And anyway, should we let China get ahead of us, or are we going to be forced somehow to feel like we have to catch up with them? No answers here, just questions. There are deeper concerns beyond the immediate. Transparency. AI is not perfect. It usually, mostly, makes the right decision, but not always. And the decisions that it makes, it cannot explain. It simply says, this is what you should do. So it's not like a human. Tell me why you made that. It doesn't know. It just went through the patterns and says, do that. This creates a really interesting question. If you're a doctor who's working alongside an AI bot, and you get a recommendation, and the AI says, ah, you know, I'm not sure I agree with that. If he goes with his own instinct, and the bot is right, that's a problem. If he overrides the bot, or if, the, if he says, I'll defer to the bot, but he was right and the bot was wrong, that's a problem. It's just going to create a real interesting dynamic. And I just use the doctor. That's true in all AI human collaborative systems. It's going to create all kinds of questions around liability and accountability. Fairness. The databases that are being used to train AI are created by humans. And humans are biased. Bias is deeply embedded in a lot of these databases. And as a result, and by the way, the bias is very hard to scrub out of the database because it's not always obvious, because it's very deep in many cases. And discrimination has already been found to occur in several use cases bank loans, job offers, bail for minorities have been proven. And there are a number of ACLU and other people working on this thing. We cannot let this happen. So there's a group working on these. Inequality. As good as it is, it's not a slam dunk that everybody will benefit. In fact, the path of least resistance is a wider separation. Benefits will go to those that can really afford them. And <clears throat> Who's going to reap the economic rewards of this? Once again, it's the big six. You've seen a lot of pushback on just how big can these guys get? And is that fair? And what should we be doing? And so forth. And as the wealth gap widens, it's going to create a number of policy issues for the, for the country itself. And a techno class elite is emerging. People that understand it and know about it, people that don't. If I had to lead one message, for people and their kids is, don't be afraid of this. Get in touch with it and learn it, because you don't want to be on the other side of that class. Trust. Weaponized AI created fake news has eroded already, begun to erode trust in public institutions. 
and actually is a threat to democracy itself. There are new industries emerging to use AI-driven robots with very friendly faces to take care of the elderly. Japan has a massive problem uh, demographically. So already they're deploying individualized bots that become very friendly and get to know through reinforcement learning. Like a baby, they learn you, they learn how you, what you think, whatever, and they talk to you and they do things. There's a sex bot industry, don't laugh, but there are people that are already wanting to know whether they can marry their bots. <laughs> it's true. But these bots, as they interact with people, they're essentially benevolent psychopaths. And what does that mean? Seriously. What is a psychopath? A psychopath is somebody that knows how to push your buttons, but has no buttons of his own to be pushed. So he's very good at manipulating you. And the question is, if you're old or lonely, are you, is this a better life, or is this emotional manipulation? Ultimately, the goal that the AI community loves to put forth, and, and, and they're working on it, is we've got to find a way that this does either no harm or little harm. And it really should be for the benefit of all humanity, not for a few. The problem is that the human values, in, even within an individual, often conflict and require trade-offs. And what I prefer and what my norms are and my values are varies very differently from yours. And the problem gets even bigger if you go global and look across communities and national borders and so forth. So the question becomes, whose norms and values should guide AI's decision? And the even bigger question is, who gets to make that decision? Well, right now, it's a few people that are doing the best they can, hoping to get it right. That's got to change. Last part. Can AI ever exceed human intelligence? Can we get to that thing I talked in the beginning called AGI, or artificial general intelligence? As I said, there's intense controversies over whether this is even feasible, and if so, when. Ray Kurzweil, the greatest bull, technologist in the world, he's a <clears throat> head of the MIT Media Lab, also works at Google, Research, he's a uh, director there. He's been saying for eight years, 2030, that's the year it happens. It might be 2029, he says, and he can lay it out, and he's been right on a lot of things. Daniel Kahneman, the behavioral economist who's actually participated in the Hastings Center project, one of my personal thrills was sitting next to him for three days. Um, he says, you know, you guys, there's a lot of hype here. It's going to be 100 years, if ever. The truth is, or not truth, the consensus is 2050. Daniel, you're way too optimistic. Daniel, you don't get it. It's going to happen, but 20 years from now, not 10, or 30 years from now. But that's in our children's lifetime. If it happens, what are the odds that it keeps going, that superintelligence will emerge beyond general intelligence? Well, I told you about AI creating AI. A recursive self-improvement process will take off, and superintelligence will occur, some people say, within weeks. Other people say within months. But that's the bit ask on that one. The question is, as it does it, what do we mean by intelligence? Is it just cognitive intelligence? Will AI also not become a psych psychopath, but acquire the equivalent of emotions? Will it ever achieve consciousness? And since we, we don't really understand what consciousness is, big debate over that. Will ASI have rights if, if it does become more human-like? And can ASI be stopped? Is it even possible to control it? And if so, when do you start? Mm -hmm. Well, there are four groups of people that think about this question. There are the people that I call the utopians. These are my labels. That's Ray Kurzweil, his colleague up at MIT, Max Tegmark. He can't wait. He thinks this is the greatest thing since canned beer, the singularity. <laughs> he said biology is unnecessary for cognitive 
it will just put it on a silicon substrate. What's the difference between a brain and, and, and a mind? He thinks there is a big difference, and it's the mind that can be replicated in a silicon substrate. There are the dystopians. The people say, game over. Elon Musk, if you want to read a great book by Nick Bostrom called Superintelligence, he says, we have two destinies. We are either going to be pets of SGI, who will treat us very nicely, like we treat our dogs, or they're going to get tired of us, or they're going to find us irrelevant, we will become either extinct. Then there are the agnostics, like Kahneman and Mark Zuckerberg, who says, this is the wrong conversation. It's too far off. It distracts society from more immediate issues that we ought to be working on. Let's work on these other things I've been talking about and not spend all this time on Hollywood stuff. And then there are the pragmatists. Yuval Harari, great author. I don't know if you've read his books, but they're Homo Deus and others. Stuart Russell, another colleague who actually co-directed the Hastings Center Project. Wonderful man, a Brit. He's out at <clears throat> UC Berkeley, and he runs a, an institute called the uh, Center for Human Compatible AI. Fantastic guy. And Stephen Hawking himself. They said, listen, it's sort of like precautionary principle. If it could happen, and the, and, the, and the implications would be dramatic, why wouldn't you do something about it right now? I mean, if we're going to get existentially threatened by 2050, why are we worrying about climate change in 2100? <laughs> this is not a or, it's an and. So those are the four groups. I think Hawking got it right. He said, AI actually will exceed human intelligence. But we cannot know now if we will be infinitely helped by it, ignored and sidelined by it, or possibly destroyed by it. But let's be prepared for it. So what do I want to say to Fred on his 16th birthday? <laughs> I'm fast forwarding now. Fred, you've grown up at an unbelievably unique time in human history. You've seen enormous creation of wealth and power. Our planet is now safer, healthier, greener, and fairer. Or maybe not. <laughs> you'll never need a driver's license. <laughs> but you'll have a job if you're curious, creative, resilient, and a lifelong learner. Superintelligence is coming soon, so your life is either going to be heaven or hell. I only wish I could be there with you. Thank you.